Coming up on Digital Music Trends 207 on the 7th of November 2014, a special on the Web Summit featuring companies like Rolly, Next Big Sound, Whole World Band, Kickstarter in Music and Open Market. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. This is a special episode that is being recorded at uh, the Web Summit in Dublin. Uh, so the Web Summit 2014, uh, the fourth edition of uh, uh, this uh, conference dedicated to all things uh, uh, online. And uh, it's the fourth edition, but already gathered uh, around 20,000 people people here in Dublin, which is uh, pretty impressive. And uh, this is going to be a bit of an interesting show. So a little bit like the South by Southwest uh, report that I did, uh, this is going to fuse uh, sort of one-to-one -one interviews uh, and a few of the topical stories that uh, uh, have happened this week. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, stick around and thanks for listening. So I'm here at uh, the Web Summit uh, 2014 with uh, Roland Lamb, the CEO of uh, Roll. So hi, Roland. Thanks for joining me. How's it going? It's going great. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you, and it's uh, amazing that we're meeting in person finally. I've, I've, been, I've seen the Seaboard many, many times, so it's great to finally actually meet. And so, first of all, can you tell us a little bit about the Seaboard? Uh, I think you're probably like 60% of my audience will know what the Seaboard is about, but uh, just for the remaining 40. Right. So, basically, the Seaboard is a new musical instrument that's based on the piano keyboard, um, and you can play it just like a piano, but then you can also modulate the timbre and the pitch of each note in a very intuitive way, just using natural gestures. So, if you want to create a vibrato, you just sort of shake your hand on the keys, except the keys aren't like piano keys. It's this soft, wave-like silicon surface um, that is, uh, it feels uh, very different from a piano, even though you can use piano technique on the Seaboard. Awesome. And, uh, it struck me that uh, you mentioned earlier in your presentation here that uh, you sort of didn't have a technical background and sort of had this um, amazing idea and decided to build it. So uh, that's, I think that's encouraging to people that have amazing ideas that are n from a non-technical background because uh, a lot of the times you hear engineers say, you know, it's so much easier if you're an engineer, you, you, know, you go and build a company. But, you know, in your case, that wasn't, that wasn't true. Yeah, I think uh, it is an important thing to remember that you don't have to be an engineer to uh, build a company. You have to be good at solving all different kinds of problems. You've got a little um, wasp on your right by you. There you go. <laughs> That's a first, actually, for the show. Uh, basically, it's about problem solving, whether it's swatting away a bee or whether it's like learning engineering or whatever. So. Problem solving is really, really important, but I think the most important thing is passion. It's sort of vision and passion if you want to start a company, because if you don't have that, it doesn't go anywhere. And for me, the Seaboard, I had an idea of what it should be, and I just had this tremendous passion for it. I, I wanted to create it, and I, I still like wake up every morning, and I want to make Seaboards and make them better and improve them and ship them to all our customers who are waiting all around the world, and I'm so excited to do that. So uh, two things. First of all, let's talk about the underlying technology uh, of how you create uh, the sounds and how it's all processed. So that, that's a big part of the company, right? It is a big part of the company, yeah. And um, we've, we've developed all the technology kind of from the ground up. The thing about developing new musical instrument is that it really requires a chain of technology. Because what you're trying to do is connect touch to sound. But, you know, that touch going all the way to sound has to go through many, many different steps in terms of how, what are you touching, then how do you detect the sensation of touch? What feedback are you giving to the hand? And then how do you translate that sensation of touch into sound? Um, and so we built a new kind of pressure-sensitive soft technology um, that would allow you to touch like in very, very subtle ways and make very subtle movements. Because if you think about synthesizers, they're all based on like one or two dimensional controls. Yeah. You know, like a, a key or a knob or a slider. And, and, and MIDI is restricted as well. And MIDI is based on that as well. MIDI is sort of based on that model. Um, but acoustic instruments don't work that way. They're based on these kind of continuous experiences. And there's a gap between the continuous experiences of acoustic music and the, the, you know, the more limited experience of electronic music. But obviously electronic music has huge advantages. So I thought, how can we bring this together? And in, in order to do that, we had to create a new touch technology called the C interface, which we use in the Seaboard. And you mentioned that you know you, you produced 88 uh, uh, models of the sort of Seaboard Grand, which is your right. your sort of uh, um, um, a flagship model yes. of, of the Seaboard, yeah. and uh, you have uh, um, two other models though that are coming onto the, onto the market that are already available to purchase, uh, right. uh, which are smaller. And so, uh, what's the plan in terms of uh, marketing those? Of course, you know the the larger models are probably purchased by professional musicians or you know people like Herbie, Herbie Hancock and and, right. and the likes. And so, uh, uh, for the rest of it, how, how are you planning to to sort of get the word out? 
Well, right now where we are, we have the limited first edition, um, which is almost sold out. It's uh, we're just making eighty-eight of them, and we've basically making them by hand, um, and those are eight thousand eight hundred eighty-eight dollars and eighty-eight cents. So they're they're professional, they're expensive. Then um, we have two other models: a stage, which is three thousand dollars, and a studio, which is just uh, three octaves, and it's two thousand dollars. And those products um, are now starting to ship, but we still have a huge waiting list. So we're really actually just focused on shipping to people who have been waiting for a very, very long time. Um, once we've uh, like cleared that backlog and got Seaboards out to everyone, then we will begin to think more about the sales and the marketing and ramping that up. But the nice thing about the Seaboard is it's kind of a story that tells itself because musicians just love using the Seaboard. And because they love it, they use it on stage and they talk about it. And um, you know, I think there's ways that we can help to get those stories out. But that's more important to us than you know maybe taking out like ads on buses. Exactly. And I guess like you know, uh, up until now you've created most of your sample banks and sort of the sounds uh, yourselves. And so uh, going forward, do you think that you'll you, you start collaborating with uh, people that are, are creating sample banks and sort of creating sort of the necessary tools to actually implement the functionality of the Seaboard. Absolutely, yeah, we're, we're extremely you know, committed to that. We've actually developed an a interesting small application called Polythrough, which many of your uh, more technical um, listeners will know the need for, an audience will know the need for, because basically um, with the Seaboard, you know, as you said, MIDI doesn't really give you enough capacity. So often with these kind of multi-dimensional instruments, you need to set up many channels of MIDI to send all that data through. But um, that creates sort of painful workarounds within a lot of the different um, DAWs that people use. So what Polythrough does is it allows you to basically um, mimic one channel over many channels in the background so it takes that all that pain away and it means though of course you can use like the sounds that we've developed which are bespoke for the seaboard but you can also use your favorite sounds from all your favorite soft sense and plugins with the seaboard so that that capacity is already available but we have some um some plans basically to make it even easier to make the Seaboard able to be plug and play um, with any kind of sound library. That's fantastic and it's very exciting stuff. Uh, and uh, the website is uh, Rolly.com, right? That's right. Yeah, Perfect. Rolly.com and uh, also on Twitter at, um, at We Are Rolly. So Perfect. I hope everyone come check it out and it's really nice to talk to you today. Absolutely and I would thoroughly recommend it. I've tried it several times and it's, uh, it's really good fun especially if you do play the piano it's, uh, it's quite fun too to play with. Thanks so much Roland for your time. And so our series of interviews at uh, the Web Summit 2014 continues and I'm here with Alex White the CEO of Next Big Sound. So hi Alex and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Very good thanks. It's great to have you and we always meet at uh, conferences around the world so that's fun. And uh, so uh, I wanted to ask you first of all uh, what's been going on with Next Big Sound over the last six months? Well we've had a good last six months we are uh, several dozen folks every day focused on making data useful. Uh, since we last spoke in, in Austin, we launched Next Big Book, which is our next, uh, our new division focused on book publishers. So two of the big five book publishers are now pushing us their daily physical and digital book sales, and we're tying that to social to help them understand which social signals are leading indicators of their sales data and which marketing activities are actually driving social and sales numbers. So um, that's been great reception and reaction in the market and uh, excited to make data useful for another creative industry like book publishing. Yeah, exactly. And that sort of uh, uh, opens up a whole, a whole kind of worms in the sense that there's a lot of different things that you can look at now. Yeah, I think that the trend of data transforming industries is, is not unique to any one particular vertical and it's been fascinating for me and, and our company to learn what applies and what doesn't and flex our technology. It's the same kind of underlying infrastructure and, and data that we're uh, delivering, um, but the insights of course and the recommendations and the data sources are slightly different. Well, what do you make of the Pandora Amp launch? I love seeing... Uh, and this is a, a drum we've been beating for ever since the company launched is the democratization of data and transparency around what's actually happening and I applaud Pandora for making this information available to uh, all artists around the world and uh, we had a similar announcement with Spotify you know a year or so ago and I know Pandora has been wanting to do something like this and it's it's very tricky and very tough to do and deceivingly difficult to display this data in a way that's actually useful for artists and managers, and I think they did a great job. Everybody's talking about the Taylor Swift story this week. It's, it's in the headlines. Uh, it made the BBC and Sky as well, like, you know, mainstream media covering it. So uh, Taylor Swift pulling her material from Spotify. Uh, you know, we, we've covered the fact that we think that it's probably a label decision rather than an artist decision, but uh, how do you feel that that can affect uh, 
uh, Spotify and on a, from a data perspective, of course, uh, how do you feel that Spotify or people looking at data uh, through a company like yourself can then prove the fact that uh, those streams are valuable? Sure. So this is a big story, and I can tell when things are big stories by the uh, rel distant relatives that text message me about it, asking for my opinion. And when I start getting texts from second cousins, I know that it's uh, kind of reached everyone outside our little music tech world. Um, and I think I'm of two minds of, of this story. So as a consumer, when I open up Spotify, Uh, or any streaming music site, I want to type in a band and hear the album and the song that I want to hear. Um, end of story, and I get frustrated as a consumer when I type in an artist, whether it's Taylor Swift or any of the other um, artists that aren't available or catalogs, uh, I get frustrated. And I know the industry and why these decisions are being made, and I often know the people making these decisions, and I still get frustrated as a consumer, so I can imagine being a step removed. So on the other hand, I also think that every artist should decide how and when their music gets listened to and yeah. whose role is it to tell every artist you must be here and there and you must do this with your songs um, that you wrote and recorded and, and produced. So um, those are the two sides and I realize they're diametrically opposed and I haven't resolved that in my head. As a consumer, it frustrates me to no end. As a, uh, an advocate for artists in the creative business, Um, don't have an elegant solution. I think this is driven, uh, it's been said publicly many times by Big Machine and testing the waters. As an entrepreneur and, and uh, executive of a company, I know that um, an acquisition is often done on the multiple of revenue and for you know a short-term decision like deciding to sell Big Machine or not, um, it's the right business call to drive yeah. revenue for this album release cycle uh, yeah. through the roof. Uh, long term, I think it's the wrong move. I think that I had hoped we were kind of, I know Spotify passed this sort of major withdrawing of, of catalog and, and music, um, but I'm hopeful that the next artist will make a bigger story around releasing first to a streaming music site. Absolutely. I mean, I, th I think you know what uh, the the good thing for Spotify is the fact that people care, right? So <laughs> I guess like the fact that we've seen coverage from all major news channels that are bringing in experts and stuff to to talk about this means that people actually are hooked to Spotify and they notice when things like that go missing. And so so that's that's sort of the underlying big story around all this. It's like okay, it's bad for Spotify that Taylor Swift is gone, but also it looks like most users are not blaming Spotify but are asking Taylor Swift to put the music back. So. I think there's a little bit of savviness that consumers are starting to have around this. Definitely, and it's interesting hearing you know, consumer and mainstream publications talking about cannibalization, and these are reports that we've been running and, and working with our label clients for years around, yeah. you know, this is, we launched three years before Spotify uh, was in the United States, for instance, and so it's always been a question. In book publishing, just to tie it there, uh, they've there's two or three services that are trying to be the Spotify for books and there's only two of the big five catalogs um, have licensed their content for um, distribution there so every indus you know industries are going through a similar thing and uh, it's a good thing for the music industry that this is as big a story as it is I believe it's frustrating on the consumer level and it's understandable on the business side Absolutely. And finally, uh, your impressions of the summit. Uh, it's your first time, uh, as it is mine. So uh, how are you finding it? It's the uh, end of the second day now. Yeah, so I just arrived this morning. First time in Dublin, first time in Ireland. I had a great uh, few meetings already and overwhelmed with the quality of attendees and the sheer size of this event. So we had lunch at the Food Summit, which is a separate uh, but attached summit. And just the flow of human beings in and out of that building was an operation in and of itself of, hey, you enter here and how do we feed, you know, 10, 20,000 people uh, in a quick and, and uh, efficient way. And all from different providers as well, like it was food coming from all, all parts of Ireland. So that was the most impressive thing to me. Like, how do you coordinate all this? There was gl gluten-free cookies and locally grown everything. And you would think at, at something of this size and magnitude, they would just kind of cookie cut or something out. But uh, great attention to detail and... and excited to be here for the next couple of days. Go and check out uh, Next Big Sound. I'm sure you all know about it if you're listening to the MT, uh, at least you should. And uh, also if you are in the book industry at all or if you also write books as well as write music, you should check out Next Big Book uh, on nextbigbook.com. Yep. Perfect. I'm here with uh, Stephen Bratt from the company InMusic. So hi Stephen, thanks for joining me. How's it going? Going good. Enjoying it so far. 
So first of all, start with, let's start with InMusic. So uh, you guys changed uh, your name, so it's a, it's a rebrand of a company. It's a new company, essentially. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about what InMusic does? Yeah, sure. So the idea being is you get every single musician on the platform gets their own website. Uh, so it can replace their traditional style website. So they can have the videos, their music, their albums, and of course they can sell directly to their fans. But the uh, the idea and the uniqueness of it is because those websites are all connected to the same network, fans can come in and kind of travel to each of those websites, collecting the music they love as they go. And I think what fans really, really want when they find artists that they, they really love, they want to connect directly with them. And that's the beauty. They can follow artists directly through the platform. They can keep up to date with their news feeds, new content that's being uploaded. And plus, because it's a, you're following other people's collections as well, when, say, if I know you're a, a great, um, uh, you have great taste in the rock genre, I can follow your rock collection. So when you find a really new, cool new song, I find a really cool new song. So that's the kind of the concept of it. And that's why we've, we've kind of decided to change from the, the older name and rebrand with something that we thought was a little bit more in keeping with what we do in music. Yeah, and of course, if you, if you uh, think you recognize uh, Stephen, it's because uh, yeah, I did an interview with them a few months ago uh, and the company was called Amaros back then and so what's the roadmap in terms of uh, you know uh, acquiring users or sort of pitching the company to people what are your priorities right now? Right now, it's really product and looking after our customer base. We've we've already got like 300,000 users, so it's, you know we've got a, quite a lot of people on the platform already. Um, it's really to make sure that their needs are 100% uh, and, and met so they're all happy. And I think from there, we'll organically grow a bit more. We've built in a couple of little tools that help artists to, to uh, I suppose, extend their reach in terms of network. So a thing called musician tagging. So because I'm a music producer and a, and a guitarist and drummer myself. So when I'm uploading one of my songs, I can tag, say, the session singer. I can tag the recording studio and the T-Boy if I wanted to. So I can tag everybody that's involved and it helps us to, it's like the old credits on an album, you know, so we, we, we can extend our network even further. And for our users, if we can get that right for them, I think they'll happily tell their friends about it. So we, we're not going, you know, mad marketing campaigns or anything. We're just focusing on the product, focusing on our core user base, making sure they're 100% happy. And only from there, I think we can progress to be something that will be uh, more of a, a household name. Yeah, sure. And so uh, moving on to uh, the usual show, which is the news-based uh, stuff, uh, essentially the, the one uh, story that dominated the headlines this week, and we're going to talk about it with a few more speakers, I'm sure, uh, through the summit, is uh, uh, the fact that Taylor Swift uh, removed her entire uh, um, uh, catalog from Spotify, or rather her label removed uh, her entire catalog from Spotify. And we, we heard loads of different points of view. Uh, you know, the, the story goes that uh, the, the decision was partially influenced by the fact that uh, uh, a big machine uh, is uh, for sale, uh, and so the fact that the label is for sale, they want to uh, sort of increase the value of a company, and so they, they decided to increase the value of the catalog by, by creating scarcity artificially, one would argue, because you know you can still get the album pretty much anywhere uh, illegally and also on YouTube. So we're seeing this being covered on the BBC, on Sky News, and all the major outlets. So uh, well, what do you think the public makes of this, and, and uh, you know what, what do you make of it? Well... I think what I make of it and what the public make of it probably slightly different. Um, I think the public in, in uh, well, generally their her true fans are loyal to her and they want to actually give her money in return for it. So I think they want to buy the album. I think they want to have possession of it. They feel like it's theirs. Those that are kind of her fans are the ones that are, just want to listen to it on Spotify and they just want to hear what's her new song and they're really not the, the hardcore fans that are going to buy it anyway. So therefore it's been taken away from them. But they're the ones I think who'll go and access it in other areas if they choose to do that anyways. And then there's the other casual people who really just don't really mind so much. It's not of influence to them. So for them it's actually a marketing ploy to to, to reach them to tell them oh come listen to Taylor's new album she's got a new album and we've taken it down from Spotify so there's a lot of different angles you could look at it my opinion I think you know I, I'm a real advocate of uh, independent musicians being allowed to earn money from their music and I think the current business model that exists for the independent artists they're not really given a chance because the amount of streams they get on Spotify are it's not enough for them to earn a decent living from it. So, you know, that's one of the things we're trying to, to, to work on is to give artists the opportunity to make money through our platform. So what I would say with Taylor doing this is, you know, a big thumbs up and, and kind of well done because I think that platform, even though it works really well for certain bands and it's a great media, um, or great way to get coverage, I guess, um, but it doesn't really help you to make money from your music. And, and I really do believe that artists deserve to earn something. And I think the future will actually be more, less less kind of private jets for, um, yeah, somebody likes my answer, um, but yeah, less private jets for rock stars, you know, but actually more independent artists being able to make a good living from the doing what they love doing. So I think it's a great move. I think, you know, I, I actually 
actually give her a big thumbs up for doing it. That's really interesting, and I'm, I'm sure we're going to hear uh, some uh, dissenting opinions uh, through the rest <laughs> of the show. Uh, and uh, uh, once again, uh, what's the best way of getting hold of uh, In Music? Yeah, it's just In Music with a K dot co. Uh, but you can actually go to In Music with a C dot co as well. But um, In In Music with a K dot co. And uh, yeah, just even if you want to ping me an email, it's Steve at In Music dot co, and tell me your opinion. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephen, for your time. Cheers. Thank you. So, we're here at uh, the uh, Web Summit uh, in Dublin with uh, Donald Scannell, the CEO of Gigstar. So, hi, Donald. Thanks for joining me. How's it going? Very well, thank you. And yourself? Great. Thanks for joining me. And so, we continue this uh, uh, walk through uh, some of the companies that are here at the Web Summit and talking about the companies and also some of the breaking stories of this week and uh, sort of fusing the two for the show. First of all, uh, what is Gigstarter all about? Kickstarter is transforming the live music industry using crowdfunding to smash open the closed circuits that dictate the industry and turning the live industry into a meritocracy. So using Kickstarter, artists get to sell pledges for tickets first and only confirm costs when they've sold enough tickets to make a show happen. So it reduces the need for artists to have big amounts of capital before they play a show and it's all about the most important thing, selling tickets. Awesome. And, and uh, how, how do you start out? We started out because I was using other crowdfunding sites uh, to promote tours, to get fees in advance for artists, but the sites didn't have the uh, functionality we needed for touring. And Gigstarter is all about managing a long-term career, whereas the other sites like Kickstarter and Funded, they're about launching a career and it's a one-off event. But Gigstarter is about building an audience, maintaining that audience, and nurturing and nurturing and nurturing. So it's a long-term view and a career-wide view as opposed to one event. So tell me about one campaign that you run that, that, that you can talk about. Well, I mean, David Gray uh, has been our biggest customer. Uh, we're just about to do our third tour with him, a third tour in 12 months. We've done two Irish tours and a whole bunch of shows in London. So he's doing a, a tour with us next month with uh, 10,000 tickets, five, five 2,000 capacity venues, all sold direct to fans. That's awesome. And so let's talk a little bit about uh, what's uh, been going on this week. Uh, everybody's talking about Taylor Swift and Spotify. I think that's all anybody wants to talk about today. And uh, so tell me a little bit about your thoughts. You know, uh, do you think that she made a good mood, bad mood? Of course, you know, nobody can judge an artist that is that big and it's been that successful. And so we're not trying to do that, but we're just trying to analyze what, what's going on here. Yeah, I mean, well, the fact that she had the largest selling debut uh, week in such a long time is incredible. I think she probably would have done similarly if she had still put it on Spotify. I think she's an amazing artist, intriguing artist. I don't agree with her decision to take it off streaming services. Maybe she could have windowed it. But for me, streaming services are a very democratic way for people to access music and a great discovery tool for music. And for me, streaming services fit in the same part of the supply chain as music. Now, the problem the live music industry has is that it hasn't replaced the CD. It hasn't replaced the purchasable format. And that's not really Spotify's problem or the streaming, other streaming services' problem. They're doing a very good need. I think the other problem Spotify faced, though, is they're so highly leveraged that they're going to have difficulty surviving in the long term, I think. I think streaming uh, is with us to stay. I think Taylor made a mistake. I don't agree with what she did. But she's not crying into her, her soup. You know, 1.3 million sales in the first week. Amazing, amazing sales. I wouldn't be surprised, though, in three to six months, if they put the stuff back and they go, okay, we've got the sales, what else can we do with putting it onto streaming? Yeah, exactly. And uh, so talking about the Web Summit, how have you found it? We're on the third day, the last day. Uh, what was what your impression? You're, you're based in Dublin, so you know, for you it's, a, it's an interesting uh, perspective. This is the best Web Summit yet. It's been amazing. They've almost doubled the attendance from last year, but it's more than twice as good. There's so much more space this year, and there's so much to do, and it's so relaxed. And people just love coming here. And you chat to people here, and they're not really intensely trying to do business. They're having a good time. A lot of people treat it as a holiday, and I don't mean that in a bad way. It's a really good way. People are having a really relaxed time, and it's a really good chance to meet people. The new app they introduced this year, arranging to set up meetings, that's been really, really phenomenal. And I've arranged some really great meetings for that, and it's been really, really cool. I don't see the Web Summit getting any smaller, because the bigger it gets, the easier it is to attract new features, attract new people, and it's a phenomenon. My only complaint is that it's in Dublin. And my life has to, the rest of my life has to continue in the summit goes on. I wish I was one of these people who got to visit the summit in another city and didn't have to do anything else except the summit. Yeah, absolutely. It's always hard when there's a conference in your town because you don't feel like you're actually there. Oh. But yeah, yeah, I, I, I get that. Although in London we don't have that many conferences, so that I don't have that problem that often. Uh, uh, thanks so much. And uh, uh, if uh, there were managers or people that uh, were uh, interested in Gigstarter, what, what's the best uh, way to uh, find out more about the company? 
Well, go to gigstarter.com, check out our explainer video, and uh, email us for beta access, and we'd be more than happy to talk to you. Perfect. So it's gigstarter.com. Thanks so much, Donald, for your time. Okay. So I'm here with uh, Kevin Godley, the CEO of Whole World Band. So hi, Kevin. Thanks for joining me. How's it going? It's going real well. Good it's to be here. It's great to have you. And so we're going to have a quick chat about what's uh, going on with you guys uh, here at the Web Summit 2014. Uh, what, what's been going on in the whole world band uh, world uh, this year? In the world of whole world band. That's a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, uh, really exciting stuff. People are responding really well to it. Um, getting some interesting artists on there. It's, it's, it's tapping into something to do with the 21st century. I think people are a little bit bored with the way music is distributed these days. Because all that's happened is there's streaming, there are CDs, and there is downloading. But essentially, you're still consuming music. What we do is allow you to take part in the creative process of making music, both in audio and in video. And I think that's getting to people. Yeah. And, and so uh, how, how have you seen the, the progress of, uh, of the app over the last year? You know, I've, uh, I've checked it out recently, and it's really come on uh, a long way since, since you, when you first launched. And, and how, is the user re how are users reacting to it as well? Users are reacting very, very well. I think initially they were a little bit shy because unlike some other uh, pieces of software or applications, it's not just audio. Yeah. So it's performance and the way you perceive yourself visually is very, impor very important to it. So I thought little, people were shy. But now it seems to be the opposite. And not only, people, not only are people playing and enjoying playing, they're thinking of different ways to communicate ideas visually. So they're using a different visual palette which is exciting to me. They're going away from just filming themselves. They're filming other things. They make little film clips to go with the music they're making. So that's, that's really exciting to someone like me who comes from both disciplines, if you like. Are you guys based in Ireland? Yep, we are. We're based in Dunleary. Wait, have you been here before? Have I been where before? Uh, to the summit. This is, no, well, actually, we did go to a summit, but it was maybe two or three years ago, and it was in a small room above a pub. So it's come on somewhat since then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, looking at the technology sector in, in Ireland, how uh, you know uh, Enterprise Ireland uh, is doing a lot uh, for startups uh, here, and so how is that helping uh, the ecosystem? And is it growing? I think it is. I mean, I think Ireland is now recognised as being a centre for technology, um, which is very exciting because technology tends to rub off on technology. So there's lots of people to interact with, lots of new people to meet, and ideas to to coalesce so it's, it's a very exciting place to be at the moment awesome and uh, to find whole world band uh, what, uh, what's the best way on the app store or on the website on the app store you can go to the website which is uh, wholeworldband.com and that will lead you to uh, the ability to download it from iTunes it's available for iPad and it's available for iPhone Thank you so much for your time, Kevin. So we're here at the Web Summit with Ashin Luni, uh, and uh, uh, you work at uh, Open Market now. So uh, how's it going? Uh, it's all good. Uh, funnily enough, um, I think the last time I was in the RDS was in my previous life as a musician. Uh, the band I was in supported U2 here back in like 90, uh, 94, 93, I think, uh, on this Europa tour. Uh, and it was awesome. So it's... Um, it's like there's a different kind of rock and roll going on. Like tech is very much the new rock and roll over here. The place is full of developers. You know, it's um, you know a lot of parties, a lot of late nights. But uh, it's a fantastic opportunity to get together to meet people from all over the world. Uh, I'm so impressed with the summit. It's my first time here, but I'll definitely come back. Awesome, man. Uh, it's great to have you on because uh, I've talked to quite a few people that are uh, predominantly in the music sphere, and so you're struggling both. And so uh, tell me a little bit about how that's come on in terms of uh, people attending, in terms of investors, or how has the quality uh, changed over the years? Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I spoke to some people. Um, I bumped into a guy earlier who I've known for a few years, and he he told me he spoke at the first web summit. There were about 400 people. It was in a really small venue, and uh, he was saying something about the food. It was all like takeaway fried sausages and stuff. It was very, very much uh, on a lower scale than this. Um, so it's uh, you know like that the the, um, uh, the the world of music is kind of uh, in a, in. A, inexorably linked with uh, the world of technology these days. The way that people do kind of uh, experience music is mostly on their mobile devices through services like Spotify and Deezer. Um, so the, the kind of uh, the, the money of tech uh, is kind of uh, really overlapping with the uh, the need of, of people to experience music in new and interesting ways. Uh, I really like the presentation uh, that we just saw in the Music Summit with um, uh, with that guy, yeah, Paul from Spotify, uh, and he was kind of demoing some kind of music mashup services that uh, that kind of uh, they've developed, such as like an endless song loop or uh, a kind of girl effect gamification remix as well. And and that was and he had a, a thing called a, a Bonzo button, which added John Bonham 
come to any track and I think that's just amazing and it's kind of interesting the way that uh, you know teenagers are experiencing music it's it's uh, you know a soundtrack to video games it's it's uh, it's obviously a huge passion you know um, teenagers who love music uh, you know love it as they always have they're kind of fanatical about bands they absolutely love them but the way they want to connect with them is very different it's very much interactive they want to kind of have access to them on social media in VIP uh, meet and greets and um, uh, another digital channel so um, yeah I think there's a great overlap between music and tech and it's, it's actually the reason I moved from the world of music to the world of technology was because I thought it was so exciting and I really felt that tech was the new rock and roll and, uh, and here we are Absolutely. And so if I finally looking at uh, sort of uh, the, the type of startups that are uh, out here, you know, there's hundreds of new social networks, there's hundreds of uh, different things going on. Uh, what, you know, what is the sector that is exciting you the most in terms of uh, consumer facing startups today? That's a really good question. Um, I think one area that's this I find personally fascinating is the world of fintech and kind of uh, innovation around financial services and how we access money, how we buy things, how we experience the whole kind of um, you know commercial experience personally. Um, so th there are some very interesting startups such as uh, Simple and Moven, and they kind of uh, offer things like behavioral banking, contextual finance, that kind of thing. Um, it kind of sounds quite dull, but actually when you think of it, uh, you know, buying and Buying things, buying and selling things is such a, a central part of our existence. If there are kind of mobile apps and startups that can make that easier, more frictionless, uh, more social, more interactive, they can kind of cut down on the bank overheads, that kind of thing. Um, I, I think that kind of thing is a fascinating area to look at. Uh, and I think it's, um, it's kind of growing very quickly. Absolutely, and everybody's talking about Apple Pay in the last month, so it's, it's coming on. Yeah, exactly. I've kind of always thought uh, the NFC really didn't have a future unless Apple implemented it. And uh, lo and behold, uh, kind of very carefully, you know, with great kind of skill and kind of marketing skill, etc. Uh, they've launched it and now NFC is kind of right back on the agenda. So um, I think the whole kind of Apple Pay ecosystem could have the same revolutionary effect on retail that uh, iTunes had on the whole digital music arena. Uh, so I think that's a, a very interesting area to watch. Awesome. Thank you so much.